Um, it's kind of funny watching Sir Ken speak and also Ian. And I always come from the point of view a leader should never be right. And when I say that, um, people look very perplexed. Because if you're right, all creativity stops. And I don't have a PowerPoint, which is great. I don't need it. Leaders need to talk from here. They need to use their intuition as their guide and understand that they're not the most important part of building a business or leading a group of people to create change. We're not. You know, you probably saw the, the, the Derek Silver one earlier on. Um, I love that for a number of different reasons. One, it's musical, and that dancing nut guy worked at my yoga studio. <laughs> he connects my two passions together, and he created a movement. And I actually used that video at a yoga retreat about two weeks ago, and then after it played, I went up with the chef's hat, and it had coconut water on it. And the thought here was I had to describe myself as a food. So I'm coconut water. I have a hard shell, thick crust, but inside I'm pH neutral, the most electrolytic beverage in the world, and I'm really, really good for you. But it takes a lot to get through to me. So think of yourself. What food would you be? Just think about that. The most popular food that I saw was everything from pizza to mangoes. <laughs> now we had everything from curry chicken to Slovakia. We had everything in there. So we had about 30 people come up and stand up here and describe themselves as a food. Every single one of those people, when they were doing that, was leading the rest of the group. Because they were leading with what? Their imagination. And to Ian's point, as he runs off to Seattle with his, with his uh, kids, is the best creative brains in the world are under the age of seven. And the most fascinating conversations you'll have with those geniuses are based around the imagination. It could be a simple, on a windy day, walking with my daughter down the like, down the like, street, the wind's blowing everywhere, she's going to kiss the wind. <coughs> Kiss the wind. So away she goes, down the street, hands up, kissing the wind. Everyone she, she ran by stopped to look at her and smiled. I don't think I had a clue what she was doing. <laughs> but her imagination and that energy that she let out affected everybody. So it's kind of funny for me because why yoga came around the same time as the birth of my son. And it was the conversations I was beginning to have with my daughter, why not, about Peter Pan. And she was like, Daddy, does Peter Pan really exist? And I'm going, yes. But my friend Annie says, Peter Pan does not exist. And I went, OK, Mira, close your eyes. Can you see Peter Pan? And she's like, yes. Well, then Peter Pan exists for you. It doesn't exist for Annie. That's okay. It's not that Annie's right or wrong, but you know in your heart that Peter Pan exists. And I said, sweetie, that's your imagination. <coughs> and that's what's going to shape who and what you are and what you become. And I cannot emphasize that more. And watching Ken talk about the whole education system and all of that, I mean, my career was I took almost four years of civil engineering, 21 years old, took a sabbatical. I never went back. <laughs> civil engineering, I never went back. But what I learned there shaped the rest of my life. What I did is I followed my heart. I wanted to release music that I loved. And I was lucky enough to be a, a co-founder of a company called Network. Over the last 26 years, be it good or be it bad, I've introduced you to Avril Lavigne, Bernadette Ladies, Coldplay, Dido, Sarah McLachlan, on and on and on. And what I loved about music 
was the song. And not for the S-O-N-G, but for the emotion that a song was. I used to grow up with a little radio, you know, trying to be really, really quiet so my parents couldn't hear me listening to it, singing songs that I absolutely loved. Those songs are bookmarks in my life. <coughs> so songs are not melodies and lyrics and four-like chords. They're emotions. In today's world, those emotions are worth a lot of money. The problem is the actual digital content isn't. Now, go try and tell an artist that the song they just wrote is worthless. In the digital space, anyone can rip it off. It's the context that you put that song in. It's the context that you put any content doesn't matter what it is that adds the value to it. So being a leader, it's very key to understand that you're never right. It's also very key to understand to find the right followers because they will embrace what you're, what you're doing and create a dream with you. There's very few dreams, I think, that are done in isolation, unless you're in your imagination and you're basically sleeping and you can imagine anything that you want. I'm quite sure a lot of us basically do. So it's, it's very important to lead from a point of not being right. Case in, case in point, every yoga studio that we open up, I make sure about three months after we've opened up, we think it's the best thing around. My team definitely thinks it's the best studio that's ever been built yoga-wise. And I'll take them there. And we'll start off right at the front desk. And it won't be an exercise of what can we add. It will be an exercise of what we can take away. And I walk them through that whole studio. It takes about an hour. You stop in every room and you look around from the lighting to the walls to anything that we see. What can we take away? Not what can we add. So what I'm trying to do is simplify those studios. The hardest thing to do is to simplify something. It, it, it's, re it's really easy to add things on. It's really hard to take things away. But when you take things away, what comes in its place is elegance. And elegance is your imagination. If you make a half wall versus a full wall, you still get that barrier. But now people see things, and we all see things differently. Everyone's perception is right in their world. It's rarely right in everyone else's world. So it's very, very key that as a leader, when you're going to lead, to understand that you must come from that place of learning lessons. I mean, a lot of people call it mistakes. I don't like negative words, personally. I you know, try and keep away from them. So they're not, mis they're, not, they're not mistakes to me. They're learnings. And in building the seven yoga studios that we built to date, there's been a lot of learnings because there was no architects who had ever really built a yoga studio. There's no developers in this city that had really built a yoga studio. So we were starting, in reality, with a, a piece of white paper. And of course, what did we do initially? We put everything that we possibly could in that first studio. Thank God it worked out and people love it. And then we spent the next ones taking everything that we could out as we went along. And guess what? They're much nicer studios. They breathe. You walk in the door, your mood changes. Now your mood didn't change because there's 80 things to look at. Your mood changed because there's very few things to look at. Except someone behind the desk smiling at you saying, how can I help you? And that human interaction is huge. So for me, leadership is about your heart. You know, Ian said it was to make himself redundant. That's brilliant. I tried really hard to make myself redundant. If I decided not to get, you know, hit by a bus but to go on a 30-year holiday, each of the two businesses that I co-founded would actually continue to grow vibrantly. Because all of those followers are so much more important than a leader. So to be a great leader, you've got to delete your ego. And you know, that can be really, really difficult. But the 
great way to delete your ego is to be selfish. And in being selfish, you become selfless. Because if you're selfish about what you want for you, then you become, you become really, really comfortable in who you are and much more receptive to what everybody else has to basically say. The way I've always approached both music and yoga is that there's millions of me. So I love a song. Not just like a song, but love a song. It affects me emotionally. I know that there's millions of me. So I've been selfish in, 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 in like, wow, this song is my song, I play it. You know, and an example that I've used is, you know, when I was in university, my friends getting stoned, playing Stairway to Heaven for the 80th time, me walking in with a short three minute version of I Will Follow By You Too. I only get three minutes before they want to take that music off and go back to the state of being that they were in. But I love that song. That was my emotion. That was my anthem. My friends put up with it. I also, over time, actually came to like Stairway to Heaven quite a lot. Um, I didn't do the rest of it, but the music actually meant actually meant a lot to me. It was the understanding that if I love something, and I do a really good job of communicating that, that will resonate with different people. But the emotions that I attach to that song will be different than what everybody else does. We can sell a million songs. There won't be one person that has the same emotional attachment to that song. Every attachment is unique. So by me becoming selfish, I become selfless. And that's really, really key for a leader. And that's how you delete ego. Because you go inside and you intuitively think, what would I want? What, you know, what do I need? And then you satisfy that. And funny enough, in doing that, there's millions of people that are just like you. And the whole yoga thing, it was really, really simple. I was tired of changing in closets. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the funny thing about yoga is it's about 80% female and 20% male. The girls might get a change room, the guy gets the closet. <laughs> the first place that I didn't have to change in a closet was in Hong Kong. They actually had a washroom for the guys. And they had showers in it. I was like, wow, I can actually shower versus having to run home or you know, whatever I have to do. And I don't need to bring my mat, I don't need to bring my towel. That suits me. And so the whole process behind why yoga was, was a napkin conversation between Lara and, and myself that lasted about three hours. And it came out of, she is a teacher, and he's a student. And how we saw the world differently, but we were looking at the same world. And it was, what did I want as a student to make that practice really beneficial for me? It was, it was a me, 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 me. But at the end of the day, why yoga has nothing to do with me. It has to do with building community. It has to do with bringing like-minded people from all walks of life into a place where their head can once again join their body and maybe not be an educator. Again, <laughs> point. If there's one thing that yoga can do, it actually can bring you in to your body. And the great thing that I've seen, which is really humbling to me personally, is I've seen so many people join this community in the last three years and grow it to be their own. Why yoga has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with the teachers that teach it, has everything to do with the community that comes to it. And the love that they have of coming together and communicating and being social. And yoga is the reason. There's a bar downstairs, and that's another good reason, too. <laughs> the yoga studio upstairs. And whatever reason, it always seems the yoga studio ends up on top of a bar. <laughs> and what I love is in recession, two things do really well. Booze and yoga. <laughs> Actually, the best way to get rid of the booze is to do a hot yoga class the morning after the booze. Um, it might be painful getting to your mat, but having to feel afterwards will just be amazing. So what I take out of this and what I love is 
lead with your heart. Let your intuition be the marriage with your imagination. If you can imagine it, you know what it looks like. The journey is not the dream. The journey is coming from the dream back into actually realizing. So the journey is backwards. I always used to say, you don't walk to your dream, you're actually walking backwards. So when you walk backwards, guess what? You're, you're gonna hit things, you're gonna fall over, and you'll never get to where you're going the way that you think you're going to. You're gonna zigzag. There's a reason why you zigzag, because there's things that you're supposed to see. So if all you're doing is looking straight ahead, you're not gonna see everything else around you. The great thing, though, is all parallel roads meet. If you look in the distance, they meet. So don't be so stuck on the way that you're gonna get there. Keep your eyes on where those parallel roads meet not down here, and always walk backwards. And with that, have a great day.